Release the hound. <laughs> Listening to The Hounds of Diana here on 24 7 World Radio. I am your host, Harrison Katz. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining in. This evening, it is May 2nd, 2022. Tonight's scripture verses, I will be reading a couple scriptures. Uh, Both of them out of the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, first starting in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, Let's jump from there to Matthew 16, verse 19. And of course, this is Christ talking to Peter. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, of course, here in verse 19, I reject the claim of the papacy, who claims that Peter was given these keys at this time by Christ. No doubt he will be given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but he was not given the keys here in the book of Matthew, especially seeing how just uh, just some chapters later, he Peter goes on to deny Christ thrice. Now, you're telling me, papas, that he did that while he whilst he had the keys. Um, it's, it's, it's quite perplexing. But nonetheless, that is not the subject of the topic this evening. Those verses pertain to tonight's show in that they both highlight in the Bible this, this allusion to heaven and earth. And of course, we know in the millennium king, millennial kingdom of Christ, that he will bring heaven to earth, that that the new Jerusalem from will come out of heaven to the earth. Um, and that is the idea of the kingdom, the kingdom that comes out of heaven to the earth. Now, this will not be a talk on the Bible, but I want to highlight that aspect of, of uh, the scriptures because the Jesuits and the occultists of the past have taken this idea, specifically the devil, I should say, has taken this idea and has incorporated it into much of his occult philosophy. So tonight we will be discussing, this will actually be part two on my first talk, which I gave, which was titled Jesuit Mathosophy. And this tonight's show is titled Jesuit Mathosophy Part 2, The Pythagoras Key. The Pythagoras Key. Now, the first video that I did, uh, Jesuit Mathosophy Part 1, I did that probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago, and it is archived on my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is Harry Katz. You can go there or just simply search Jesuit Mathosophy, spelled M-A-T-H-O-S-O-P-H-Y. Yes, a, a word of my own concoction. Now, in that video, I went over the history in the scientific realm and its connections to how the Jesuits, throughout their inception, have guided our scientific view on the world, and specifically how they used mathematics and philosophy combined together to bring us to where we are today in this current scientific paradigm. And uh, uh, if you want to look at one gentleman, which I discussed, if you want to call him a gentleman, that really highlights uh, 
that idea of this blending of math and philosophy, you really don't need to look any further than uh, Rene Descartes, the French uh, Jesuit trained so-called father of modern philosophy. And he was instrumental in pushing that idea that philosophy could not be expressed in exact terms, <clears throat> pardon me, until it was explained by mathematics. So having said all that, if you have not heard my first show on that, it will not matter as far as tonight's contents because this is more of a complement to part one, and it is not necessary that you indeed have listened to the first. So this evening, we will be diving into the occult foundations to, not again, not so much the science, but the historic occultic teachings and influence from the time of Pythagoras, and then we're going to end up, hopefully by the end of this, this, uh, this hour, wind up in the 20th century, and specifically around the time of World War II. Now, Pythagoras of Samos. Now, many of you may know him from your schooling and learning in math class and geometry, learning about the Pythagorean theorem. And if you only know two sides of a right triangle, how you can find out what the third mystery side is. Now, that is, unfortunately, for, for most of us, that is where our understanding of Pythagoras starts and ends. And we really don't know the profound impact that this man has had on um, not just history, but ideas that have carried throughout history. So Pythagoras was born on the island of Samos, uh, in the Greek island of Samos, and he is said to have lived somewhere between 570 B.C. and 495 B.C. Now, he, of course, like I said, he was a Greek philosopher and also a mathematician. And But he, <laughs> Pythagoras was more than just a mathematician and a philosopher. He devised a whole religious system around his mathematics and, and, the, and numbers specifically and his, his specific brand, if you want to call it numerology in a very simple sense, and he was heavily uh, influential. Um, he influenced uh, Plato, uh, other philosophers. Um, uh, you had the Neo, Neo-Pythagoreans, and then he also, um, throughout even into the Middle Ages, and some of the uh, some of the papists, some of the scientists that we covered in Mathosophy Part 1, such as Nicholas Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Einstein. I mean, Pythagoras had a huge influence, his ideas, over a lot of different people. Now, some of his teachings, um, very interesting. Uh, now, he believed in this kind of transmigration of souls, kind of an idea of, of reincarnation, that a soul never dies, but that it just leaves one body and, and goes to another. Now, within that, he also taught a very specific system, which he referred to, or which uh, modern uh, uh, researchers or, or historians attribute to him. They call it the harmony of the spheres or the music of the planets uh, it's known by by many by several different names and it maintains that the planets and the stars as they move in the heavens they move according to mathematical equations and that these and that the, the heavens and the movements themselves correspond to musical notes and thus they produce this kind of inaudible symphony Again, the symphony of the, sp the spheres, the harmony of the planets, I mean, or however you want to, to, uh, to allude to it. Now, there – he also had a huge uh, – just – I want to touch a little more on his influence. So during the Middle Ages, or basically during the Dark Ages, Pythagoras was revered as the founder of mathematics and music, 
which are two of the seven liberal arts. And we'll get into that in, in a couple minutes here when we start discussing Jesuit education. He, appear, he appears in numerous medieval depictions in illuminated manuscripts and in the relief sculptures on the portal of the Cathedral of Cartres. Um, see, in the preface of the book on the revolution of the heavenly spheres, which was written by Nicholas Copernicus, the uh, Dominican, the Catholic, um, in 1543, Copernicus cites various Pythagoreans as the most important influence on the, the development of his heliocentric model of the universe. And this is absolutely correct because Pythagoras had his own cosmology in which this eternal uh, sun was in the center and that all the planets revolved around them. Also, he was one of the first or one of the earliest sources that historians can find that's, that claimed that the earth was a sphere. Pythagoras, he was one of two. So you can see how Copernicus was absolutely influenced by Pythagoras, not only that the earth was a sphere, but that it was helio, it revolved around the sun in a heliocentric fashion. Um, Johannes Kepler, he considered himself to be a Pythagorean, and he believed in the Pythagorean doctrine of the Musica Univer Univer Universalis. Musica Universalis. Sorry, my Latin's a little, a little rusty. But that, again, is referring to the music of the spheres or the harmony of the spheres. So you had, again, influence this – you have Pythagoras with his occult idea of the planets and this, this musical scale and these sounds that they produce. You have Kepler believed in them as well. Isaac Newton firmly believed in the Pythagorean teachings of the mathematical harmony and the order of the universe. Though Newton was notorious for rarely giving others credit for their discoveries, <clears throat> he attributed the discovery of the law of universal gravitation to Pythagoras. Albert Einstein also, he believed that a scientist may also be a, quote, a Plat Platonist or a Pythagorean insofar as he considers the viewpoint of logical simplicity as an indispensable and effective tool of his research, end quote. So as you can see, the, the, the big boys of science, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Einstein, and I'm sure there are many, many more that are not even mentioned in this brief little article that I'm reading, who were deeply influenced by Pythagoras, and not just his math, but his mystical or his occult aspects of his teaching. Now, when we're dealing with and talking about this harmony of the spheres, the biggest part that you, uh, the, the biggest part of this that um, that a lot of people miss, is that this is where the underlying idea of Western Hermeticism comes into play with the idea of as above, so below. As above, so below. So Pythagoras taught that, yes, as these planets are revolving around us in the, quote, macrocosm, and they're producing all these sounds, internally within you, you have that same, that same cosmos within you and as, as, a, as a microcosm. And therefore, you have to bring or raise your own vibration or musical scale or uh, octave, however you want to refer to it. You have to raise that vibration within yourself, and it's all instituted Pythagoras' teaching through the understanding of this numbers. And a lot of that has been lost to, to exactly what the techniques were because nothing was really written down. Everything was given uh, – was taught orally, and we really only have secondhand information, and even some of that is can, – can be brought into question. So the question remains,
was Pythag this Pythagoras man was he just a man was he just a philosopher and what kind of impact did he have on just the uh, uh, the place where he lived in the time that he lived so Pythagoras even though he hailed from Samos he eventually moved to Croton which is a city in the south of Italy. And when he was there, he and his Pythagorean cult, essentially, took over the government and instituted their own form of Pythagorean society and politics, if you would. And it's very, very interesting stuff to look into, and I would recommend anyone who wants to do a little further research on that to do so. So we have to understand in the timing when these men, uh, the scientists that, that we talked about, uh, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, these men in the, in, in the, in the quote-unquote Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, they were being trained in these universities that were heavily influenced by the Jesuits and the Catholics and specifically the Jesuit order. And we can see that Ignatius himself was influenced by this Pythagorean style of teaching. And when we get back from this break, we will continue with our second part on the look of at Jesuit Methosophy and the Pythagoras Key. Join me on the other side. This is 24-7 World Radio, your source for the truth. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags amerikanische Zeit für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bude Nico. U bent hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke Dienstag om 2 Uur amerikanische Standardzeit het Duitse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization and expose the counter-reformation of the Jesuit order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. You're listening to Your Source for the Truth. This is 24-7 World Radio. Welcome back, everybody, to the Hounds of Diana. I'm your host, Harrison Katz. All right, continuing where we picked up, I just want to emphasize that Pythagoras, when it came to the time of the Reformation, so starting off in the 16th century, let's start there, he was revered as, as one of the fathers of math and music. And specifically, Pythagoras and his quote-unquote school of teaching involved math, 
specifically math like geometry, music, and astronomy. Of course, astronomy and music going back to this idea of the harmony of the spheres or the music of the spheres. Okay, so having that understanding, we are going to be reading now from a page out of a book titled Parallels and Responses to Curricular Innovation, the Possibilities of Post-Humanistic Education, written by Brad Pettit Fills, and it was published in 2014. Reading from page, page, is this, page 34 under the title of the Ignatian Curriculum Part 2, the Trivium Quadrivium. Within the overarching structure of the modus comes the actual progression of courses. To this end, Ignatian turn, Ignatius turned to the Renaissance humanism of Paris and its adherence to a medieval system of classical education. The Trivium Quadrivium. Lestens and Higgins note, quote, the curriculum at Paris grew out of and adapted for its own use the, tradi the traditional seven liberal arts. Remember, I mentioned those before. The trivium, which is grammar, rhetoric, and logic. The quadrivium, which is, now listen to this list again, mathematics, geometry, music, and astronomy. Now, one other thing that was central to Pythagoras was, of course, his theology, his religious, if you would, philosophy. And, of course, the Jesuit Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius Loyola, would take that same model and apply it as well, including in the quadrivium under the Jesuit uh, radio statorum, he would include math, geometry, music, astronomy, and theology. And the quadrivium, which is mathematics, geometry, music, and astronomy, so central to the medieval university. This progression is adapted. Naturally, the, Jesu the Jesuits would add courses in theology and repeated a number of times throughout the constitutions and the ratio, which is the ratio statorum of the Jesuit order, and speaks to the Jesuit idea of the cura personalis. Because Ignatian Humanism assumes that a student will experience well-rounded education. The Jesuits found a successful model in the Trivium Quadrivium. Now listen to this. The Trivium was considered to be the foundation of a well-rounded education, as one needed to be well-spoken and erudite in one's reasoning before one was able to move on to the more sophisticated study in the Quadrivium. As Scaglione Scali notes, the arts of the Quadrivium, namely mathematics, music, astronomy and geometry were intimately connected as aspects of a mystical divinely established bond among the parts of the universe and between man and his environment a i'm going to repeat this a div mystical divinely established bond among the parts of the universe and between man and his environment remember what i was what we said what i was talking about before the break Going back to this Western Hermeticism, as above, so below. This idea of the, the macrocosm, the solar system, and the universe, and that we have all that contained in ourselves. And that's the secret key to, quote-unquote, enlightenment. Now, Ignatius soaked all this stuff up. Continuing, this would have clearly been an attractive option for Ignatius as the mystical summons contained therein spoke to his own emphasis on the discerning soul. The notion of this, quote, divinely established bond also warrants mention, particularly through the discernment process itself. The quadrivium, inasmuch as it is built on the foundation of divine bond between individual and the environment, as parts of the connected universe, permeates the process of discernment. In short, the quadrivium is a mechanism that, for students of Ignatian discernment, can be used to recognize one's potential in this temporal world. Now, when you look at what the Latin 
wrote the Latin, uh, the, the meaning to this Latin word, quadrivium, it means the fourth road, or the four roads, I believe, or the fourth road. The fourth road. Very, very interesting. So, a little later on, after Ignatius leaves Paris, of course, he establishes his Jesuit order, gets accepted into the papacy, the Company of Jesus, 1540. And then he begins to embark on his education mission and beginning to establish what a Jesuit education is. And that is what the ratio statorum. And that is where put this Pythagorean, this whole Pythagorean idea and occultic hermeticism got started to be pushed in the universities. Well, really not started, but really took it head on because once the Jesuits took over and Ignatius got a, finished his ratio statorum, it flooded all the European universities, and that is what the vast majority of people at that time were learning. They were getting Jesuit educations, even in Protestant schools, majority of them, not all. So then sometime later, in 1655, you have the notorious Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, who publishes a book called Arithmologia, Arithmologia, and it was published in Varese in 1665, and it was dedicated to Franz III Nadasdi, and let's see, the content it was concerned with exploring numbers as the underlying principle and structures of the universe, and as the key to the mystic understanding previously revealed to patriarchs and philosophers in ancient times. Okay, specifically, he's talking of, amongst others, speaking on Pythagoras. Pythagoras. Now, when you take a, if you look up at a copy of this, Arithmologia, spelt A-R-I-T-H-M-O-L-O-G-I-A, and you go to the images, you will see an image of a nine-pointed star, and underneath that, a circle, which looks like the, uh, the, the, uh, the heliocentric model. Now, that nine-pointed star with a triangle in the center, mind you, we will get back to that symbol because that is the Pythagorean symbol. That has been hidden in plain sight for a long, long time, but we'll get back to that. So you had another mention of uh, of explaining the the mystery of the numbers, and uh, and Ana Anathasius Kircher, Athanasius Kircher, uh, the the Jesuit in 1665. Now, from my understanding, there was a long period of basically non-teaching as far as to the, uh, to the profane, all right? Not until there was a man who came about, a Russian mystic by the name of Gurdjieff, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, or Gurdjieff, last name spelt G-U-R-D-J-I-E-F-F. -F. <clears throat> he was born sometime between 1866 and 1877, and he died in 1949. He was a Russian philosopher, mystic, and spiritual teacher. He was also a composer, and... Even though he was considered Russian, he was of Armenian and Greek descent. Now, Gurdjieff has <laughs> – Gurdjieff is a very, very interesting character. Unfortunately, most of – most researchers in the West have 
have never heard of them. Um, they're much more familiar with uh, some of his contemporaries like Blavatsky or Crowley. But Gurdjieff was different, <laughs> to say the least. <clears throat> but he is still in uh, occult circles and even, let's call them, uh, satanic witchcraft covens. He is highly regarded in his specific working, in his teaching, his philosophy, his occult philosophy. It is still highly regarded even to this day. And some of the people that he influenced with his teachings are, are – were not only influential but had enormous impacts on history. So let's get into a little bit of Gurdjieff. What did Gurdjieff teach? Well, Gurdjieff taught that the vast majority of men do not possess a unified conscious consciousness, and they are living in a state of hypnotic waking sleep. Okay, Everybody is asleep, according to Gurdjieff, and it's only through his teachings that you can be awoken or that you can be woke. Let's put it like that. So you want to get woke, you got to learn from Gurdjieff. Now, he also taught that men, as tripart beings, do not, when they are born, do not possess a soul. You don't have a soul according to Gurdjieff. A soul is something that you have to acquire through what he called the work, the work, which was the, what he called his specific work form of occult philosophy and discipline. Now, according to Gurdjieff, that his, his, uh, in, through his instructions and his principles that you would be able to awaken your conscious and you'd be able to be more spiritually enlightened than the, uh, than the monks, than the yogis, than the uh, Islamic mystics. Now, Speaking of Islamic mystics, Gurdjieff was heavily influenced by uh, mystical Islam known as Sufism or the Sufis. And Gurdjieff is also the one that brought the dancing or the whirling dervish to the West when he came to the U.S. and also in his travels throughout Russia and in Europe. So if you've ever seen a whirling dervish who's, who's performing specific movements – and it's constantly spinning. That is a ritual, a cultic ritual prescribed by Gurdjieff. Now, Gurdjieff was uh, – his discipline was called the work, and later it was also known and referred to by him as the fourth way. The fourth way. Now, remember what we just were discussing about the Jesuit – Quadrivium, how that is known as the fourth road or the four roads. Now, Gurdjieff, much of his past is shrouded in mystery and myth, as most occult, uh, cult leaders, when they die, they are, you know, eulogized and seen as some saint, and there is a lot of uh, exaggerations and falsehoods in their histories, but a basic timeline of Gurdjieff, you can – looking at it, you can find some very interesting things. For one, Gurdjieff, at the age of 16 or 17, moves to Tiflis in Georgia, moves to Tiflis and tries to enter the Archdeacon's Choir at the Gregorian – Theological seminary there in Tiflis. Now we also know that that is the same uh, the same seminary that Joseph Stalin, aka Joseph Yugoslavli, he also attended Tiflis seminary. 
And then later on, supposedly Gurdjieff uh, either didn't was was uh, was rejected or got kicked out, and then he began traveling the east through uh, through Afghanistan, through the deserts, through the Gobi Desert, into Tibet. Spent some time in Tibet, and then eventually made it made his way back into Russia. Started teaching his occult philosophy, his fourth way, and then eventually migrated to Europe from Russia, and then. From there, eventually made it over to the U.S. and I think the 20s. Now, Gurdjieff, his influence on the people who he influenced of his time were of no small name. We have to understand one of the most attractive things about Gurdjieff's work was that it did not matter whether you were a man, a woman, what race what ethnicity, what culture, what background you came from, it didn't matter. He saw everyone as being, until you were awoken, until you were woke, you were essentially walking dead. And he refers to people in those very terms, that they're not even alive, they're walking, they're asleep. So... In order to change that, not only is it a process of being awoken, but you, you become something new. Once you build up this literal substance that Gurdjieff teaches you, you become something new, a new man, a new man. And this was very attractive to a lot of people, and Gurdjieff attracted a lot of poets, artists… Dancers, um, intellectuals, mathematicians, of all sorts. And when we get back, we will finish our talk here on the Hounds of Diana at 24-7 World Radio. Listening to 24 7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. This is Eric John Phelps. Please listen to my broadcast, The Eric John Phelps Show, as I preach the true gospel of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, defend the Protestant Reformation that birthed Western civilization, and expose the Counter Reformation of the Jesuit Order seeking to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world. Join me every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on 247worldradio.com. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören, jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags, amerikanische Zeit, für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. Ich bin Hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke dinsdag om 2 uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Duitse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen en 3 uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbel waarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is 24-7 World Radio, home of Eric John Phelps and Vatican Assassins. Welcome back, everybody, to the Hounds of Diana. I'm your host, Harrison Katz. So getting back to our topic, this 20th century Russian mystic, Gurdjieff. And we're, I'm going to be going over some of his – well, a lot of his connections and people who he influenced, and these people themselves were influencers. 
So Gurdjieff was very instrumental in as far as starting in the uh, in North America what was known as the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. And again, it wasn't a direct – he didn't directly influence, but he influenced major players within that movement such as Jean Toomer, also who was born Nathan Pinchback Toomer, and he was an American black uh, – African-American black – American poet and novelist, and he was – of course, he's associated with the Harlem Renaissance. Another black man associated with the Harlem Renaissance, known as Alain Leroy Locke, he wrote a very popular and very influential book at the time titled The New Negro, an Interpretation, which was published in 1925. And this is supposed to be like the – quintessential book on uh, as far as influence in the Harlem Renaissance. And this man, this whole idea of the new man that is brought about by one's thinking capacity, right? Through one's work, the spiritual work that you can do, you can build within yourself a new man. So Alain Leroy Locke was also influenced. Now, Another man who was a student of Gurdjieff was a – he was a German occultist by the name of Rudolf von Sabatendorf, also known as uh, Alfred – Adam Alfred Rudolf Glauer. So, so what was Sabatendorf known for, anyone? Well, he started the th occultic – Thule Society in pre-Nazi Germany. He was its founder. He was a student of Gurdjieff. And here's a quote from him. By about 1912, he, meaning Sabatendorf, became convinced that he had discovered what he called, quote, the key to spiritual realization, unquote. Described by a later historian as, quote, a set of numerological meditations, exercises that bear little resemblance to either Sufism or Masonry. A set of numerological meditation exercises. Yeah, he got that from Gurdjieff. Now, it is also very important to understand that the Thule Society were the, was the first occultic society to adopt – the swastika, which is a Eastern and Buddhist symbol, which Gurdjieff got in Tibet during his time there, which he in turn gave to Sabatendorf, which was the influence behind Hitler adopt Hitler Hitler's Nazi Party, National Socialist Party, adopting that symbol. Now Another very key instrumental man in the Nazi Third Reich who was also a follower of Gurdjieff was none other than Karl Haushofer. That's right, the German general, the professor at Munich, the geographer, and the, quote, politician. Now, he was a follower of Gurdjieff. He was also with Gurdjieff in Tibet at the same time time. Now, Haushofer would go on – I believe he had a, a radio show in Germany that was extremely popular. He had a lot of followers. Uh, he was a professor. He was a, a, an intellectual, and he also developed the idea of geopolitik, which was the basis for um, a lot of uh, – which was a theory which was taken by um, – uh, the Jesuit priest, who I believe his name was uh, Stanfel, and was then given to Hitler to put into Mein Kampf. So though I cannot say that Hitler was a practitioner of Gurdjieff, he was definitely influenced by the men around him who were. Not only that, but you will find that in Hitler's Nazi, Nazi Germany, you have this idea of the new man, though it's not brought about in exactly the same way that Gurdjieff preached. Though Gurdjieff preached a combination, a balance of 
of whether it be physical work, spiritual work, and let's say emotional work. The Nazi idea of bringing about a new man was purely genetic, or let me say purely eugenic. So he went about it. His, the, uh, the, the, the German idea, the Nazi German idea of the new man was a little different than, let's say, the idea of the Soviet new man. Speaking of which, Joseph Stalin was directly influenced. He, I do believe he knew Gurdjieff, and I do believe that he studied directly under him. And this has been written about in numerous places, but I'm going to attempt to go over all the sources that I have to prove this. Now, first of all, you have you have a speech that was given by Berea, who was the head of the internal the communist ministry, internal ministry during Stalin's reign. In 1935, he gave a speech titled On the History of the Bolshevik Organizations in Transcaucasia. And in the, at the very end, in the back of the book, he gives a, a, quote, chronology of Comrade Stalin's arrest, exiles, and escapes. And in 1908, March 25th, Comrade Stalin was arrested in Baku under the name of Gyoza Nizharadze. Comrade Stalin is sent to Belov prison, which is – this is his second arrest. Now, that name that Berea gives here, Gyoza Nizharadze, that direct name was mentioned in one of Gurdjieff's posthumous – in his post posthumous uh, – his, his uh, autobiography that was released after his death. And he notes that one of his followers that was with him went by that very same name. Gyoza Niz Haradze. Now, so that's one confirmation, one from – so between what Gurdjieff wrote in his book and what Berea said in 1935. Secondly, you have Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, who was later, when she emigrated to the U.S., was known as Lana Peters. Now, why did she change her name? Well, because she got married. Who would she get married to? She got married to one of Frank Lloyd Wright's pupils, Mr. Peters. Now, Frank Lloyd's wife, second his Frank Lloyd Wright, his second wife, whose name is Olgivana Lloyd Wright, she was a follower of Gurdjieff. And the whole reason why when Svetlana, Stalin's daughter, came to America, she joined Frank Lloyd Wright was because of Frank Lloyd's wife, Frank Lloyd Wright's second wife, Olgivana, supposedly because she was a Russian. Right? Because of her well, no, the, the connection is Gurdjieff. Further, you have Stalin's grandson, Alexander. Berdonsky, who also went by Alexander Vasilevich Berdonsky Stalin, but I believe he dropped the Stalin the Stalin name. This was Stalin's grandson, and he was a Russian theater and film director. All right, and in a quote that he gave to a Russian magazine, he says, "Quote: I don't think that this, when asked about if uh, if 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 uh, if, uh, if Stalin's real father." was a Russian explorer by the name of Pizewalski. Stalin's grandson answers the reporter and says this, I don't think this is the case. Rather, the point is different. Stalin was fond of the teachings of the religious mystic Gurdjieff, and it suggests that a person must hide his real origin and even shroud his date of birth with a kind of veil. The legend that Pizewalski, of course, poured water on this mill. And what looks like – so please, there are still rumors that Saddam Hussein was the son of Stalin. So he's saying that the whole idea of why Stalin changed his name, why it's – why there's two different dates given for Stalin's birth was because according to Stalin's grandson himself, Stalin was a follower of Gurdjieff. So you have all these 
these, these ancillary details that are lining up. Not only that, but when you look at when Stalin got into power and started the Soviet Union, one of the biggest points of the propaganda to the Soviet people was this idea of what they called Homo Soviticus, the new Soviet, the new Soviet man or the new Soviet woman. And this idea, which was very communistic, was that by working, that by work, you will become something new. You will become a new man. Okay, so even Stalin's occult connections, which many people have kind of struggled to make, you can find them in the Russian mystic Gurdjieff. And there's a lot more there that I probably won't be able to cover tonight. So Gurdjieff was also a huge influence over the cult of Cthulhu and in the Temple of Set. Both of those, both of those black magic covens, whatever you want to call them, are heavily influenced by Gurdjieff. Also, Timothy Leary. He was a he was a follower of Gurdjieff, and it was through through one of his writings that you come to find out that one of the secret rights, if you would, of the Gurdjieff system was in fact taking drugs. So Gurdjieff was not immune to the whole drug culture. Now, lastly, the probably the last person we're going to be able to get to tonight as far as his uh, Gurdjieff's connections was a Jesuit trained Bolivian philosopher named Oscar Acaso, who was born in Bolivia in 1931, and he was trained by Jesuits in La Paz in Bolivia, and I think in in Lima in Peru as well, or no, he was trained at Jesuit University in La Paz, all right? And now he studied the Gurdjieff system, and in 1968, he founded the Institute of Nociology in Santiago, Chile, and then he moved to Ara to Arica, and now he has the Arica Institute in New York. Well, this man teaching the Gurdjieff system teaches a a very key point in the Gurdjieff system is how do you track your progress when you do this work? Well, in the Gurdjieff system, you do so on a symbol called an Enneagram. An Enneagram. Now, what is an Enneagram? It is a is an it's a uh, I'm trying to find the simple. It's 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 a symbol with nine numbers. With the numbers one through nine on it, placed in a specific order, and it's through your mapping of going through these that that Gurdjieff teaches that you move through the different octaves, much like Pythagoras, you move through these octaves to a higher vibration until you ultimately get to godhood. Now, what's interesting about this enneagram that Gurdjieff specifically taught was that the Jesuit trained Oscar Acaso began teaching the enneagram as we know it today. And from his school in South America, a group of Jesuits learned the system, the Enneagram, and brought it back with them to the United States. Specifically, Richard Rohr, last name R-O-H-R, learned the Enneagram from this group and one of, the, one of the first people to publish a book about it in English. And if you look at this, I, don't, I, I have not seen this taught in many Christian circles lately, but during the 70s when it first came about, it was popular. It was known as the Enneagram of personality, the Enneagram of personality, and it's occultic, and it's ultimately Jesuit. Now, this Enneagram, getting to this symbol, this is where it all, t again, ties back to Pythagoras. If you want to understand what the occult symbol behind, let's say, the square and compass in Freemasonry, you have to look into something that is called or referred to as vortex math. Vortex math. Now, most of you listening have probably never heard this, so I encourage you to go online and look this up. Now, you may find people who talk about this uh, uh, ascribe to, to this vortex math certain religious doctrines and teachings, much like Pythagoras did, but if you just understand the, the, the numerical and mathematic connections that exist 
in this, let's call it the Enneagram, in this symbol. It is extremely significant to understanding the, this idea of hermeticism, this idea of as above, as above, so below, and that just as the heavens are in perfect harmony, that if you yourself internally can become in this kind of harmonious state, that you too can become this new man. And I encourage everyone, if you are listening to this live tonight, that you make it over to my YouTube channel, because when I do post this, I will be posting some pictures to go along uh, uh, for some visual aid, so you can take a look at these symbols, and hopefully I encourage you to look into Vortex Math yourself. When you just understand the basics of it, and you understand what the symbol that gets drawn out is, it will blow your mind as it did mine. So everyone, I thank you for listening tonight. This has been another episode of the Hounds of Diana, 24-7 World Radio. If you appreciate this type of information, I encourage you to donate to 24-7 World Radio. Go to the website, go down to the donate button, and click there. Also, I encourage everyone to go to my YouTube channel, Harry Cats, and take a look at some of the videos I have to offer. Until next Monday, God bless.